In this session, we're going to look at surveying an archaeological site, a site you may have just yourself come across and want to know what to do about it. My name is Mike Haig, and I'm the project director of a brand new operation called Reg Hunters, aiming to teach the skills and techniques of diving archaeology in the crystal clear waters of the Caribbean. We are based on the tiny island of Utilla, focused on the remains of an 18th century wreck, which we have come to know as the Oliver, a perfect underwater classroom to teach these skills. And as a prelude to that, I am running a series of sessions on the techniques that diving archaeologists use in their everyday work, looking at the challenges they face and the solutions they have to those challenges. So how do you survey an archaeological site underwater? This may be a site that you've discovered by extensive research and searching in the field for years. Maybe a site you've come across simply by chance. Most of the wrecks I discovered, or worked upon rather, have been discovered by fishermen when they lose their nets. Whichever way it is, a survey is the first thing to do. It's called a pre-disturbance survey. And what it aims to do is to look at the topography of the site as she is the story so far, as it were. The objective of this exercise is to get enough information to plan further activities. This may well include excavation, but if we remember that excavation is in fact destruction of a site, we need to be very careful about how we go about these things. Your survey may simply need to lead to a more detailed survey or just a partial excavation. Anyway, whatever way it is, the objective is straightforward enough, is to record a three-dimensional record of the site as she stands. This is achieved by largely two-dimensional plans and some measurements and some other recordings. We need, however, to think about a few things before we start off on our survey. Practical things. First thing, of course, is going to be what is the site's situation. If you are working in warm, clear waters, great visibility, the techniques you can use are like to be different to those that you are limited to if you're working a site with poor visibility, which may be in current. Second thing, of course, is the actual topography of the site. If your wreck is slammed up against some rocks in crevines, then you have to think about how you're going to get around that. And the third thing, of course, is the actual wreck itself. It's very different to set up a grid on a flat site with a few timbers sticking out than you have in a situation like you have in Sicily, in the south of Sicily, with many marble wrecks, where the wreck is literally a, a, a jumble of very large marble blocks. So you've got to be adaptable. Anyway, there are probably 10 key things that need to be achieved in a pre-disturbance survey to get a good idea of the wreck. If you can do all these 10, then you have a pretty good record to work from. The first one of these is going to be set up a grid. Now the grid needs to cover the whole of the wreck site if possible. And you need to have a bit of an overlap, at least a meter I would say. What you end up with is your wreck site divided into grids, which you can then work through and do more detailed work. The second thing you need is a baseline. Now a baseline can follow a visible part of the Wreck itself, if the keel is exposed, ideally you run your baseline along that. If you haven't got much exposed, then just run the baseline to the middle of the grid. This means you have these, the grid and the baseline to make point to take measurements from. And that is what you get in number three. You get an outline plan of the site, which is a great start. Then, of course, number four, um, it's a great idea to do a sketch of the site. Now, Back in 1984, when the Southern Bay wreck was discovered, because a fisherman lost his net, one of the first members of the project on the technical committee undertook a sketch of the site. Not that easy when the visibility was about two metres. That sketch, when compared to the photo mosaic we did three years later, was actually very accurate. So, it's a really good idea to get a sketch of the site, if you can do, because it's going to really help you with your forward work. Another thing you need to record is the orientation of the grid and the wreck itself. In other words, how does she lie? North, south, east, west? 
or whatever. The grid may lie differently to the rec, simply because of physical restrictions on where you can put it. And a word about the grid. When I talk about a grid, I'm not talking about metal poles. I'm talking more rope and cord, which obviously over large areas is much more workable than trying to construct big metal scaffolding arrangements. Those tend to come later when we talk about excavation. It's also a really good idea to get an idea of the, the layout, the, the contour of the, of the wreck. With the Oliver, we know, for example, that when she was originally worked, that the divers moved the ballast to one side of the wreck. And we've only taken a, a, a contour plan, a contour of the, of the Oliver, using intersections of the grid. And that has shown us pretty comfortably, we're pretty confident we know where the ballast was, was put. Another useful thing to do is to probe the site. Now, this can be done using air probes if you have such uh, things around, or just a simple piece of angle iron which has been bent to a handle. This will give you a really good idea of how much material is lying over your site and how much you have to work through to actually get down to the, to the actual remains of the wreck. Now, the thing with probing, you need to be a bit careful because obviously you are pushing your probes through an archaeological site and you don't want to do any damage, so you need to be quite careful about about how you do that. You need to make drawn and photographic records of all the visible remains of the site. With drawing, it's normally a planning frame that's used. Photography, really important to get a scale in. The number of sites in the past that were recorded without people putting the appropriate scale in is, uh, is uh, frightening. I carry with me and I have for many, many years, uh, three pieces of aluminium cut to 10, 20, and 30 centimetre lengths with uh, black and um, yellow banding, one centimetre and two centimetre bands, uh, which are great for this kind of work. The ninth thing you can do, if the visibility allows you to do it, is to record a very basic photo mosaic of the site. Now, one year we were working out in Sicily on a wreck called the Alberti, which lies in 40 metres. We were able to lay out some ropes on the wreck site, and I hovered, literally hovered, at 30 metres, taking overlapping vertical photographs. This produced a pretty good result and allowed us to plan future work, because obviously working at 40 metres, you need to have some good planning to maximise your diving operations. And the final thing you can do, if you have the resource, is an underwater metal detector survey, because this is great for showing you where the material may be under the surface. So you can focus your plans in the future using that. Now it's really important to be clear about what we're trying to do in archeology. span um, We're not really surveyors. We're not really trying to get very, very exact measurements. That's a different thing. What we're about is stratigraphy. We're about how things relate to each other because that's how we understand a wreck. You are working on what, what was once perhaps a very noble vessel. We need to try and bring these things back to life. And it's the interrelationships between the artifacts, between the remains, that give us that insight. Obviously, there's a logistical part to this as well. For a survey, you're going to need quite a lot of kit. You're going to need ropes. You need angle line. You're going to need floats, concrete for making stuff. So if you work in remote locations, then the idea of supplying all that is quite challenging and you need to work into your plan. Lighter stuff, you know, drawing frames, not so hard, you can transport those. As we all know, I think, if we ever try to do any work underwater, that most things that are not practiced on dry land first tend not to go very well. Practice indeed does make perfect. This is why courses like ours are so important, because it's no good just leaping off the side of a boat thinking you can do a survey, because you can't. It's really critical to build those skills up. There are, of course, other ways of surveying sites. There are electronic methods. You can set up transponders and bounce different wavelengths to them. You can use um, certain sub see surveying equipment will produce some sort of survey. But in the main, we're dealing with surveys which divers do using tapes and measures and equipment I've discussed. And that will give you a really good record of what's there, allowing you to plan for future work. So once you surveyed your site, 
There's other stuff we're going, you can do. And next time, we're going to move on to talk about how to use underwater metal detectors, both for survey and also for the location of sites. And until then, I wish you all safe and enjoyable diving.